If we're all exposed to Barnum's statements so often, why do they keep working time after time? Credibility is huge. I mentioned Tommy Muscatello having significant credibility with the British royals, even though he wasn't British and hadn't devoted his life to studying the royals. But people believed him. Credibility gives us a reason to trust the huckster or con artist. If we believe what they're selling, we're more likely to give them our money. That's why so many people invested in Bernie Madoff's huge Ponzi scheme. He was a successful Wall Street financier and had just enough people vouch for his prowess as an investor. It's the exact same reason people called Miss Cleo in the 1990s, a fortune teller and self-described Jamaican shaman. Her advertisements showed testimonials, always beware of testimonials, of people who were blown away by her predictions. You see that sort of thing enough and you start to believe it yourself. However, if you decided to call her, you ended up talking to somebody else on a phone service called the Psychic Readers Network. You may have even spoken to a non-psychic with a script full of Barnum statements. The issue here isn't really whether Cleo's predictions were wrong or right. I mean, with Barnum statements, you're bound to be right sometimes. It's the persona and bait and switch of the whole setup that's the problem. It's the Wizard of Oz moment, figuring out that there's not a great and powerful entity, but rather a sad man behind the curtain. It turns out, Miss Cleo was born in Los Angeles, not Jamaica, and had a background in theater, not any sort of mystic arts, and she definitely wasn't a psychic. Unfortunately, people didn't get to see behind the curtain until the Federal Trade Commission filed a complaint against the Psychic Readers Network. They contended that the company offered viewers a free reading and then charged them for it. The company was also charged with bullying customers into paying fees they weren't legally obligated to pay. In the end, the Psychic Readers Network paid $5 million in fines to the FTC and agreed to waive $500 million in outstanding customer charges. Another reason we get duped by this bias is that we love hearing about our positive traits, but we often don't like to admit that we even have negative traits. I certainly don't have any negative traits. <laughs> Anyways, when people are asked to rate how well positive versus negative personality traits apply to them, they will accept the positive traits, but reject the negative ones. This might be nothing more than self-serving. We like the positive and reject the negative. However, I contend that it's more than that, because I argue that these positive trait statements are merely a disguise for flattery. And we all know where flattery leads. One last way we're influenced by this bias is if the message is personalized to us. Remember in the movie Big, Tom Hanks' character's younger self is depressed about being a young boy at the carnival and that exact moment Zoltar appears? It's almost like the mystical force knew exactly what that little boy needed at that moment. It was personal. He was the only person Zoltar wanted at that moment and made the boy his mark. Overall, if your horoscope book includes your name, you're more inclined to believe what it is saying. There are horoscope apps that include your name in daily readouts. It's a small hook to make you feel like the most important person in the world in that moment. The reverse can also be true. Using the wrong personalization can undo everything. The science fiction sitcom Futurama uses this truth to great comic effect. In one episode, the robot character Bender is missing and the other characters seek the assistance of a robot medium, in the style of the aforementioned Zoltar, to speak to the missing Bender. The medium uses the name Bonder when acting as though she has embodied the ghost of Bender. The character of Fry immediately questions her credibility and calls her a fraud 
because she said the wrong name. The punchline from the robot medium is telling. Look, you want false hope or not? Personalization is a powerful tool for those exploiting this bias, but it can quickly become a liability if used incorrectly. I've talked a lot in this lecture about the basic qualities of this bias, the bias of being duped. It seems pretty simple, but is it universal? In other words, do all humans have this bias or is it a product of only certain cultures? Do we get duped and conned, as some have hypothesized, due to a particular Western brand of individualistic egotism? In 2009, researchers Paul Rogers and Janice Sewell used Barnum statements to ask both American and Chinese participants the same kinds of questions we've talked about in this lecture. China and many other East Asian countries have a different overall culture than Western countries like the US. China is more collectivistic. People from these countries are more likely to view the group and society as more important than their individual selves. They're more interdependent than independent, as Americans tend to be. Because of the differences between the two cultures, researchers expected to see that the Chinese participants wouldn't fall for the Barnum statements in the same way that Americans did. Rogers and Sewell were surprised that the Chinese participants were just as likely to rate the Barnum statements as attributable to themselves. And just like the Americans, Chinese participants agreed with the Barnum statements at the same higher than average rate that we discussed at the beginning of this lecture. The researchers concluded that there aren't cross-cultural differences. In other words, it seemed to them that humans have a basic susceptibility to being duped. The bias is seemingly ingrained in our thinking. So what do we do? How do we avoid getting conned? Knowing how Barnum's statements work is half the battle. In my social psychology class, I talk extensively about social influence. Things like persuasion, conformity, obedience, and yep, you guessed it, compliance. My students definitely enjoy the compliance lecture the best. We talk about the techniques they can use to get what they want. One of those techniques is flattery. Students discover that they've probably been employing that strategy for years, but now I've named it as part of a psychological concept. Their minds are blown. Along with other techniques like complaining or reciprocation, they now have an arsenal to get what they want from the people in their lives. Sometimes these techniques will work. Sometimes they won't. For any number of reasons because humans are complex. But I tell them to be careful because these same techniques can also be used against them. The other thing I tell my students to do is practice using these techniques. Be deliberate, but perhaps not obvious. The more you practice, the better you become at it. How do you think con artists get so good enough to swindle old ladies out of their wealth? The better you get at getting compliance, the better you'll become at spotting its use against you. Other aspects of social influence go into this mix too. You'll have to be wary about conformity. In Dr. Seuss's book, The Sneetches, a huckster approaches the non-star belly sneetches with a machine that puts a star on their belly so they'll be more like the happy and content star belly sneetches. Early in the story, these non-star belly sneetches express a desire to live like the star belly sneetches. And so, this con man approaches the non-star belly sneetches with dreams to be just like those star belly sneetches. They get the chance to look like the happy and content sneetches. And once one non-star belly sneech pays the fee and goes through the machine, the next one does, and so on. Well, if everyone's doing it, it might seem like that's the only option to achieve happiness. The star belly sneeches don't like this development. They express anger and frustration that they're no longer special among sneeches. 
Eventually, the huckster doubles his money by developing machine to remove the stars from the bellies of the previously star-bellied sneeches. The huckster fooled both groups by using their own psychology against them. And he made a lot of money until all the sneeches banded together to put a stop to him. The desire to conform and the forer effect are dangerous because you might think it's your only option to agree with the huckster's pitch. Everybody is doing it, so why should I be different? Astrologers, fortune tellers, and other psychic practitioners are usually looking for one thing only, your money. It might be easy to say, I'm not that gullible, and you know, you might not be that gullible. But just know that the barnum forer effect weasels its way into the simplest of decisions. You could even say it might actually be the oldest trick in the book. Look, we all want to feel validated. I want to be validated in my thoughts and behaviors too. Beware that feeling if someone else is asking you to self-validate. That's subtly different from that person validating you directly. They get you by flattery. Then you get the self-validation from whatever they say next. <laughs>